Our next speaker is Don Key from Dana-Farber, who's been a longtime leader of clinical pharmacology, and is going to talk about MUG1 biology and target for therapy. Thank you, Dan. So uh, I'll be uh, talking about MUC1, uh, an oncogenic protein that is not a receptor tyrosine kinase and uh, has been thought for many, many years to be uh, an undruggable target. So uh, so I'll I'll, uh, be talking uh, uh, about uh, the scientific background that supports MUC1 as a uh, a potentially attractive cancer target, and uh, the uh, development of agents that uh, block MUC1 function. So uh, the early work on MUC1 was focused on its overexpression in about 90% of, of human breast cancers, and that led to its uh, characterization as a uh, sorry as a uh, high molecular weight glycoprotein and uh, led to the development of the CA153 assay to, uh, for its detection in, in plasma. And then uh, with the, the cloning of the MUC1 gene, we found that it contains a uh, unique structure of variable numbers of uh, 20 amino acid tandem repeats that are extensively glycosylated. And uh, that structure has now been found in a family of some 20 proteins uh, that are known as, as the mucins. And, uh, among others, uh, CA125 or MUC16 is a member of this family and overexpressed in, in ovarian cancer. Now, the mucins play a very critical role in protecting our epithelium, which is a single cell layer uh, that's exposed to the external environment. For example, lining the respiratory tract and the gastrointestinal tract. Our epithelium also lines the lumens of, of uh, ducts in specialized organs, such as uh, liver, pancreas, and kidney. And as a result, uh, this epithelial layer needs a very robust defense mechanism for its protection. So the mucins come in uh, two different forms, secreted and transmembrane. And the secreted mucins form the uh, mucus gel, a physical barrier that represents the first line of defense. And uh, the transmembrane mucins contribute to that uh, barrier, shown here, but also, and importantly, uh, signal stress to the interior of the epithelial cell, promoting uh, growth, uh, survival, and and repair of the uh, epithelial uh, layer. Now, MUC1 is a uh, transmembrane mucin. It's synthesized as a a single polypeptide, undergoes autocleavage in the ER, and then moves to the cell membrane as a uh, a heterodimer. Uh, The uh, N-terminal subunit, MUC1N, contains uh, these tandem repeats that are extensively glycosylated. This is the mucin component of the heterodimer. And it's tethered to the cell surface in a complex with the transmembrane subunit or the carboxy-terminal subunit, MUC1C. Now, early attempts at uh, targeting MUC1 were focused on, on uh, the N-terminal subunit because it's easy to make antibodies against this subunit. And, and these uh, attempts at targeting MUC1 were uniformly unsuccessful, largely because uh, this subunit is shed from the cell surface. Now, more recent work uh, uh, has focused on the uh, transmembrane subunit which signals stress to the interior of the cell and uh, induces uh, transformation. Now, it's also important to point out the uh, positioning of MUC1. And for example, here, uh, our epithelial cells, of course, are polarized uh, with the apical border facing the environment and the basal lateral borders uh, expressing receptor tyrosine kinases. And uh, MUC1 is uh, positioned at the apical border, affording uh, protection against the uh, uh, external environment. And with uh, stress or with transformation, there's a loss of polarity. And now MUC1 is expressed on the entire cell surface and can form complexes with RTKs. Okay. Now, um, 
I'll give you an example. Uh, this is a breast tumor that uh, stained with an antibody against MUC1. And you can see that uh, in the center is a normal duct. And you can, uh, there's a fine rim of staining with this uh, antibody against MUC1 along that apical border of this normal ductal epithelium. Now, with, uh, in the foci of carcinoma cells that surround the normal duct, there's more intense staining. MUC1's expressed on the entire cell surface and, and, and accumulates in the cytoplasm and is upregulated about 50-fold uh, in this case, which is fairly consistent with many uh, breast cancers. Now, MUC1 over the years has been found to be expressed in other types of tumors as well. For example, non-small cell lung cancer, castrate-resistant prostate cancer, uh, gastrointestinal tumors, particularly pancreas, and gynecologic tumors, uh, for example, ovarian. And there's a huge literature on MUC1, and its overexpression in general is associated with more aggressive disease and metastases. And MUC1-induced gene signatures uh, are associated in, uh, in breast, lung, and prostate with uh, uh, poor, disease-free, and overall survival. Now, somewhat paradoxically for an epithelial antigen, uh, MUC1 is also found in hematologic malignancies. Virtually all primary multiple myeloma cells express MUC1, as do the uh, cell lines. And uh, certain lymphomas, for exa example, anaplastic large cell lymphoma, in CML, MUC1 is detectable in blast, but not chronic phase cells, suggesting that, that it may be associated with more aggressive disease. And uh, David Avigan at the Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital has, has recently shown that MUC1 is, is expressed in the uh, myeloid leukemic stem cell, but it's not detectable in normal hematopoietic stem cells. So, um, Taken together, then, this uh, uh, expression of MUC1 in, in very diverse uh, uh, carcinomas uh, and, and uh, certain hematologic malignancies has made it a potentially attractive cancer target. Uh, in addition, the MUC1 knockout mouse has, has no phenotype, indicating that you might be able to target this molecule without adverse effects. And uh, importantly, uh, the uh, MUC1 C subunit is an oncoprotein. And again, just to remind you that the MUC1N subunit is the mucin component. That's, that's out of the story here, and we're focused on the transmembrane subunit. Okay. Now, the evidence uh, uh, for uh, its oncogenic function is, uh, is uh, just listed here. If you overexpress this uh, subunit, and, and indeed uh, the cytoplasmic tail, it's sufficient to induce Anchorage-independent growth and tumorigenicity. Uh, there are transgenic uh, models, for example, MMTV MUC1 transgenic mice uh, uh, generate uh, mammary tumors of all sorts of diverse uh, histopathologies, and some of these tumors are metastatic to the lung. And uh, uh, overexpression of MUC1 also blocks death in response to stress, for example, in response to DNA damage. Uh, reactive oxygen species, hypoxia, just to give a few examples. Perhaps recapitulating its normal function to protect our epithelium against uh, environmental stress, such as toxins, microorganisms, uh, even low pH in the stomach. Okay, so um, with that as background, then, how do we uh, target this guy? So. Um, Shown uh, schematically here is kind of a summary of, uh, of what happens to this subunit in the cancer cell. So here it is positioned at the cell membrane. Forms complexes with RTKs uh, that are uh, mediated by a galactin-3 bridge. And as a result, the cytoplasmic domain of this subunit gets phosphorylated. It moves into the cytoplasm where it forms dimers. And the dimers are necessary for its import into the nucleus, where it interacts with transcription factors and activates genes involved in growth and survival. And the dimers are also necessary for uh, transport 
of uh, MUC1C by HSP70 and 90 complexes to the mitochondrial outer membrane where it protects against uh, activation of the intrinsic apoptotic pathway. So we reasoned that the Achilles heel of this subunit might be its dimerization. And in order to uh, uh, identify amino acids uh, responsible uh, for that uh, function, uh, we needed to turn to uh, 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 the uh, uh, structure of, of this subunit. And it's shown here schematically. This is the piece outside. It's 58 amino acids, has a 28 amino acid transmembrane domain, and a 72 amino acid cytoplasmic domain. Now, uh, this is the amino acid sequence of the cytoplasmic domain. Uh, it's phosphorylated by numerous kinases, just a few of which are, are uh, shown here. For example, MET phosphorylates uh, tyrosine 20, which is a YHPM site that's a consensus when phosphorylated for binding of uh, uh, PI3K SH2 domains, leading to activation of, of the AKP mTOR pathway. Uh, EGFR and SARC phosphorylate tyrosine 46. ABL phosphorylates tyrosine 60. The uh, wind pathway kinase GSK3 beta phosphorylates this serine. And uh, there's a consensus uh, sequence here uh, for binding of the wind pathway effector beta catenin, allowing uh, this subunit to form a complex with beta catenin TCF4 to drive cyclin D1. Now, um, mapping the sequences, the, the amino acids for uh, the dimerization led to the finding that uh, these two cysteines here in the cysteine glutamine cysteine motif was essential for dimerization. So we reasoned that if we could make drugs against uh, this motif, uh, that we might be able to block MUC1 function. And, uh, uh, the first uh, approach we used was a, uh, uh, a uh, uh, cell penetrating peptide drug. And uh, uh, so, for example, you can uh, link uh, transduction domains to peptide sequences. And uh, so, our idea was that uh, we made this uh, peptide drug, it penetrated cells, binds to the cytoplasmic domain of the MUC1C receptor uh, subunit. And, and blocks its ability to form a dimer. It's a pretty simple approach. Okay. And uh, then uh, one of those drugs, uh, GO201, I'll tell you a little bit about another one, uh, binds this region, actually blocks dimerization, and shuts off uh, these two uh, uh, pathways as a result. So uh, let me just tell you a little bit about uh, uh, what we did, the evolution of these peptide drugs. And, and personally, I think that uh, there are going to be more and more peptide drugs uh, entering the clinic uh, to uh, uh, target uh, previously undruggable uh, proteins. So uh, for example here, uh, 201 was the first one we made. It was L-amino acids and, and incorporated the first 15 in the cytoplasmic domain. And the control for GO201 was uh, th uh, this uh, a peptide here where we mutated the two cysteines, so to alanine, so it's AQA. Some of the work with 201 has already been published, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about GO203, where we moved to D-amino acids. Still has the, the transduction domain. It's shorter, and the D-amino acids afford more stability and are less likely uh, to develop uh, inhibiting uh, antibodies. And the control for GO203 is, is uh, this peptide here, again, with the mutating the critical cysteines. Now, uh, just to show you a little data with uh, 203, uh, this, this is a, a study that we're doing with uh, uh, Maurizio Scaltridi and Jose Bezelga uh, using their uh, breast cancer cells that overexpress ERB2. Uh, SKBR3, uh, for example, and, and treating these cells uh, with uh, GO203 peptide at 5 micromolar, associated with an initial in inhibition of proliferation and then uh, loss of viability. And uh, this pattern is, is similar in uh, the uh, SKBR3 cells that are resistant to Herceptin. 
And we have similar results in the BT474 cells that are sensitive and, and resistant to uh, uh, Herceptin. So um, now uh, we're interested, of course, in, in what the mechanism is here. And uh, in contrast to uh, Herceptin, uh, which has a little effect on the phosphorylation of RB2, a treatment of the uh, SKBR3 cells with GO203 associated with down regulation of phospho RB2 without an effect on RB2 levels. And uh, uh, that response is similar uh, in both the uh, sensitive and Herceptin resistant cells. You can see here a down regulation in, in phospho RB2. And we also see a down regulation in AKT in the uh, sensitive cells and in the resistant cells. And uh, as we've heard, uh, it's important to, to block both pathways, AKT and ERK. And uh, you can see that uh, uh, using this approach, we also see down regulation of uh, ERK activation uh, here in the sensitive and resistant cells. Now, if we take uh, uh, 203 uh, into animal models, this is a, a breast cancer uh, estrogen uh, uh, ER. Uh, alpha expressing breast cancer uh, xenograph growing in nude mice. These are established tumors here, about 100 uh, millimeters cubed. We're treating every day for 21 days. This is a vehicle PBS. If we treat with 203 at 10 milligrams per kilo, there's no effect. Uh, if we go uh, 20 milligrams per kilo, you see there's inhibition of growth during the treatment period, uh, and then the uh, tumors uh, uh, regrow. But if we go to 203 at 30 milligrams per kilo, there's inhibition of growth during the treatment period, and then these tumors slowly regress over time, and there are long-term uh, survivors. Now, this type of response is not restricted to breast cancer. And uh, uh, For example, here's uh, H1975 non-small uh, uh, lung cancer cells, which as you know are EGFR mutant. Uh, resistant to TKIs. Uh, here again, xenograph model, established tumors, uh, treated with PBS, uh, treated with the control peptide CP2, which does not block MUC1, no effect. And here, treatment with 203 at uh, 30 milligrams per kilo, a marked inhibition of growth, and then long-term survivors. And uh, as we saw in, in the breast cancer cells, you can see the treatment with 203 associated with uh, inhibition of uh, AKT and uh, mTOR, uh, indicating that, that part of this effect may be mediated by uh, suppression of this pathway. Okay, so uh, based on these and other findings, we took 203 uh, uh, to the clinic, and uh, the clinical formulations known as GO203-2C, uh, uh, the uh, phase one trial is underway. We've treated eight patients, no toxicity so far, no anaphylactoid reactions, and uh, the trial is ongoing. As backups, uh, we've made uh, alpha helical uh, peptide drugs based on the sequence of GO203, and we've uh, identified small molecules. We set up a dimerization screen and went to the HMS facility, screened about 5,000 compounds, got a number of hits. Uh, uh, several of which are natural products, interestingly. And uh, they block dimerization. And then we've uh, mused, moved those hits now into a structure-based lead design, making uh, uh, additional small molecules. So these are backup compounds. Now, uh, uh, one can target uh, uh, molecules in the uh, uh, cell membrane, uh, both uh, uh, in the intracellular domain and potentially in the extracellular domain. So we reasoned that perhaps we could uh, make drugs against the uh, 58 amino acids that extend outside the cell. And uh, uh, here, here is the uh, amino acid sequence of the uh, 58 amino acid extracellular domain. Uh, here's asparagine 36 that binds to galactin 3 that links this subunit to various RTKs. And um, so uh, two approaches are being used, of course, by pharma these days. One is uh, to make antibodies against 
uh, the extracellular domain, and, and uh, we've done that against critical regions. The other approach is to make a, a soluble receptor, okay, like a, a VEGF trap, where you take the extracellular domain, you link it to a, an FC molecule, and um, uh, we've done that, and I just want to show you a little data there. So the soluble, uh, re we call it the soluble receptor, I guess you could call it a MUC1 trap if you wanted, um, but uh, it has uh, dose-dependent effects in vitro, and it's active in, in xenograft models, and I'll just give you one example. Uh, so here, uh, these are ZR uh, breast cancer xenografts uh, treated uh, with a, a PBS here, and a dose of one milligram per kilo of this uh, soluble MUC1 receptor has no effect. And if you go to uh, 10 milligrams uh, uh, per kilo, twice a week for three weeks, you can see a slowing of tumor growth. And then uh, if you increase the dose further, three times a week for three weeks, you get more complete inhibition of growth, and here we're getting some long-term survivors. So there's a dose-dependent res uh, dose response of this agent in vitro and in, in vivo. Okay, so um, to summarize then, uh, we think uh, that uh, this uh, transmembrane subunit of MUC1, again, not the mucin component, is uh, a druggable uh, in the extracellular domain with uh, soluble receptors, and uh, we have a, now a panel of monoclonal antibodies that react with this region, uh, and in the intracellular domain using uh, uh, peptide drugs and uh, eventually uh, small molecules. So um, we think that uh, targeting uh, this uh, MUC1C subunit may be broadly applicable to uh, uh, diverse carcinomas and hematologic malignancies in that uh, overexpression of this <coughs> subunit, excuse me, is a common alteration in, in uh, many cancers. And uh, I hope I've convinced you that uh, it's definitely a, a druggable target uh, in uh, using agents against the uh, extracellular domain and the intracellular domain. So uh, I'll stop there and answer any questions. Thank you. <coughs> awesome. Questions? Let me start with one question. Is there any insight about biomarkers that would identify subsets that are sensitive to MUC inhibition? Uh, there are uh, a number of antibodies that uh, uh, we've made now against the uh, cytoplasmic domain, so we can stain tissues with those biomarkers there and uh, hopefully predict which patients will respond. But uh, you can have high levels of MUC1 expression and uh, 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 th those tumors would be responsive to these inhibitors. You could also have low levels uh, and, and they can be responsive. So it's not necessarily dependent upon amount that's expressed, excuse me. Don, the peptides have to get into the cells to, to work. Wh yeah. What can you tell us about, uh, first, the pharmacokinetics of these <coughs> small peptides, but then secondly, their ability to get into cells? Yeah, uh, good question. So uh, uh, these, these peptides uh, have short half-lives because they're cleared uh, by the kidneys. And, and uh, so uh, you have to give them frequently. and. Uh, we can deliver them subcutaneously. Uh, we, we're, the, the clinical trials IV, that was sort of a proof of concept, but uh, uh, we've done animal models now of delivering sub-Q. So, so that's, a, that's one way to get around this. The other way to get around it is to put them in nanoparticles, and that's a terrific approach. Uh, uh, you know, you give it once a week and they're effective. So, so I think we've solved that problem. To, to get the peptide into cells, you need that transduction domain and uh, uh, you need to have one micromolar levels. It's like a, you have to push it in. Uh, yeah, that's right. And uh, uh, whereas if you use the uh, alpha helical peptides, uh, a la Greg Verdine and Lauren Walensky's, uh, uh, you don't need the transduction domain. The alpha helical peptides will go right in. Uh, so you can get rid of that uh, component of the drug. Um, and uh, and they're, they're very stable. And, it's possible you could give these, these uh, alpha helical peptides orally. <clears throat> the problem is the solubility. You lose solubility with the alpha helical peptides. Nanoparticles to 
<coughs> yeah, the nanoparticle approach is really, really interesting for these peptides, Trev. As I mentioned earlier, I think the peptides will be, um, we'll see more and more of them in the clinic uh, for undruggable targets, okay? John, I was yeah. just wondering if uh, in your phase one, are you following the T cell responses also from the perspective of, uh, I know that this is targeted, but <coughs> also are you activating another arm in, in this setting? Uh, we're, we're not, we're looking for antibodies. Uh, uh, you know, these D-peptides, they don't present uh, uh, by uh, MHC complexes, so, uh, or, or very little. Um, so uh, I'm not sure you'd get a T-cell response, and, and uh, uh, general experience is that you don't get antibody responses against them. <coughs> this can be briefly described as, do you know, uh, do you have any systems where the drug doesn't work? And that more, in more detail, do you know does it have to be binding to a receptor in order for the drug to work? And particularly in ZR751, what do you think Muck is doing? What are you inhibiting when you give your dimerization? Yeah, um, so uh, uh, th this approach does not work in, uh, so if you take prostate cancer, for example, uh, hormone-dependent uh, prostate cancers are not dependent on Muck1. Those cancers are not sensitive to this peptide. but. As the uh, uh, tumors uh, become uh, castrate resistant, uh, that's when you start to see the sensitivity uh, to these agents. Um, and uh, uh, the, the mechanism, uh, I think, is in part related to these complexes with RTKs at the cell surface, but not totally. Uh, you can block MUC1 function at the mitochondrial outer membrane and in the nucleus. So um, it's, it's not all uh, RTKs or, or, and I don't think it's all inhibition of uh, PI3, AKT, or ERK. Thanks very much, yeah. Don.